Joining me now, Arthur Delaney, reporter for the Huffington Post. His article today details how Paul Ryan's policies can actually be traced back to the 19th century. And also with us, James Peterson, professor at Lehigh University. Thank you both for being here. Thanks, Ralph. Thank you. Arthur, great piece today. Tell us, how, tell us how Congressman Ryan's ideas to help the poor go back to the 19th century. Well, a model for Paul Ryan has always been the welfare reform of 1996, in which Newt Gingrich and Bill Clinton teamed up to make our welfare system for mothers with children a lot less generous. And at the time, a big inspiration for Gingrich and congressional Republicans was the charity reformers of the late 19th century, the people who are talking about indiscriminate soup being uh, the problem that's causing this phenomenon of tramping. There, were, there was a tramp crisis at the time, and they were saying, we got to quit giving out all this soup. It's making the tramps worse, and instead we need to be their friends, uh, give them love and friendship. Now, this and, you know, is in the 1800s? <laughs> That's right, uh, and this, you know, this is an idea that has been, was popularized at the time by Marvin Alasky, uh, who wrote a book called The Tragedy of American Compassion, which is still a popular book today. Though, to be fair to Paul Ryan, I don't think he will propose we abolish every federal welfare program that's gone up since then and return us to a, a soup-based safety net, but this is a source of inspiration for Republicans today. I mean, uh, James, the, today's Republican Party sounds amazingly, though, like some of these 19th century quotes that we're hearing uh, from Arthur Delaney's uh, Huff Post piece today. They do, Rev. I mean, they've taken nostalgia to an entirely different extreme, and you can see how this cuts across the swath of issues interested in. But Mr. Ryan and his colleagues, first of all, they've got to know that poor people have friends, uh, poor people have souls, they go to church, uh, poor people are accountable, um, and the reality is that there are structural limitations to reducing unemployment in this society. There aren't enough jobs. Um, and so to moralize them and to overly moralize them seems inappropriate. The reality is here, Rev, they should take that moral compass argument and let's apply it to the 1%. Yeah. Let's apply it to the wealthiest among us and see if their morals are accurate, see if they're giving back enough, see if how they conduct their lives in an everyday sense uh, is consistent with what they believe are the, should be the morals of this country. To sort of blame poor folk here uh, seems to be not only misdirected, uh, but also inaccurate in terms of addressing the issues of structural poverty in our nation. And you know, there's not only soup or, or welfare, it's other issues. F FDR, he signed the first minimum wage law way back in 1938. Just listen to what Republicans are saying about it now. This is a state-level concern and issue. So does that mean that, uh, is a federal minimum wage then, is that unconstitutional in your mind? I don't see anywhere that it has been constitutionally defined. Where are you on the minimum wage? I believe that minimum wage decisions need to be made by the state. Instead of focusing on this sort of defeatist mentality where we've got to up the minimum wage, why don't we focus on creating better paying jobs? The federal government has absolutely no business being involved in mandating salary and wages um, in the private sector, none whatsoever. So it's shocking, Arthur, what you point out, but James, this is a law that FDR signed in 38. What are they talking about? Again, this is, you know, they have, there's a series of throwback politics, Rev. It's the minimum wage, it's access to health care, um, it's tax policy. And remember, within the Republican Party, Rev, as you've documented on this show, there is a that since Obama has emerged as, as president, there are constituents of the Republican Party who feel like America is no longer America, that there has to be some kind of overarching reclamation process. I mean, that to me just seems to be absurd. The reality is, is that we do need a federal minimum wage because we need the federal government to lead the way for no. the private sector. Part of the reason why poverty is so pervasive right now is simply because the minimum wage is too low. Now. Let me ask you, Arthur, what about these, the, these poverty tours that Ryan is going on, where he's going around the country to see uh, the poor and what can be done about poverty? What is your feeling about that? I think this is something that really does differentiate Paul Ryan, and is, it makes it worth looking at his rhetoric all the more closely, because this is not something any other Republicans, to my knowledge, are doing right now for the past year, really ever since... 
he, uh, he had that photo op in the 2012 campaign where they were washing pots and pans, and people said, well, is that, are those pots and pans even dirty, Paul Ryan? Uh, he has embarked on a totally different approach with no media. It's been other people telling us about these visits he's done, going into poor neighborhoods and looking at non-governmental programs that help poor people help themselves. And he's working on some new proposal that he'll bring out this summer uh, we don't know what it'll be, but, but presumably something that'll help these kinds of groups, maybe a voucher that poor people can take and get this kind of uh, faith-based uh, counseling to help them get their lives back on track. But or it's not really... Or maybe but... we'll have to read more 19th century reformers to find out what he's coming up with, because so maybe. far it sounds very, very uh, much like stuff that we've heard 150 years ago. And it's not only this, you know, James, when you look at the fact... In 1973, Roe versus Wade happened. 65, uh, Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act. Yet you have 11 states have uh, made abortion illegal after 20 weeks. You have other states claiming that uh, they're doing things that are really uh, violating and rolling back the effects of the Voting Rights Act. It's almost like they're acting as if what is established is not established, and what is ancient becomes new to them. It is, Rev. They believe that their political viability going forward uh, is going to be situated in this kind of retrograde, uh, looking backwards uh, kind of politics. And what they used to sort of underwrite a lot of these policy changes is this whole sort of ideology or the doctrine of states' rights, which also, by the way, is a throwback uh, to yeah. sort of Civil War era federalism versus uh, uh, state sovereignty kinds of, of politics. What we know about states' rights is that, unfortunately, sometimes when you allow states to make policy that the federal government should be responsible for, oftentimes it's easier for states to discriminate against certain protected classes yeah. without the sort of over, well, uh, the oversight the, of the federal the, government. The, the problem and the fight and the battle states' rights against a strong federal government for a long time. Arthur Delaney, James Peterson, I'm going to have to leave it there. Thank you for your time tonight. Thanks, Thank Ryan. you. Still ahead.